Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming to the uh, first event in term two for our Americas in the World series with the Institute of the Americas. Uh, my name is Aaron Hiltner. I'm a lecturer at the Institute of the Americas. Uh, and we're really lucky today have a excellent panel, uh, Professor Carol Wise, uh, Professor Kevin Gallagher, who should be hopefully arriving shortly, and then Professor Gustavo Oliveira. So I'm gonna give short introductions for each of our panelists. I'll have some brief opening comments, and then we'll go through 10 minute opening statements uh, that should last in total about half an hour. And then we'll open it up to all of you uh, with any questions that you may have for our panel to discuss. So Carol Wise is professor of political science and international relations at the School of International Relations at the University of Southern California. Professor Wise specializes in international political economy and development with an emphasis on Latin America and Pacific Asia. She has written widely on trade integration, exchange rate crises, institutional reform, and the political economy of market restructuring in the region. Uh, Wise has just completed a book-length project, Dragonomics, How Latin America is Maximizing or Missing Out on China's International Development Strategy. Uh, which analyzes the rapid and remarkable ties that have developed between China and Latin America since the 1990s. Our second panelist will be uh, Kevin Gallagher, who is the director of the Boston University Global Development Policy Center, the interim dean of the Party School of Global Studies, and who is a professor of global development policy. Gallagher serves as co-chair on the T20 Indonesia Task Force on International Finance and Economic Recovery to the G20, the Chair's Council on the United States Export Import Bank on China Competition, and as the International Chair of the Greening the BRI Task Force of the China Council for International Cooperation on Environment and Development. He's also a member of the Task Force on Climate Development and the International Monetary Fund, and he's the author or co-author of seven books, with his latest being the case for a new Bretton Woods with Richard Kozel Wright. Our final panelist will be uh, Professor Gustavo Oliveira, who's assistant professor at Clark University. He is a human environment geographer whose research focuses on Chinese finance and investment in Brazilian agribusiness and infrastructure. He also studies critical geopolitics and the global political ecology of soy, pesticides, biofuels, and land struggles, agroecology, food sovereignty, and environmental governance. A member of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network Science Panel for the Amazon, he was also the co-principal investigator of a USDA-funded project on COVID-19's impact on the U.S. food supply chains. His current book project is Brazil, China, and the Global Land Grab. So, very uh, great thanks to our panel for being here. I'll have our, some brief introductory comments uh, about what our panel is going to be discussing today. So the panel, I think, really centers on the political economy of Chinese Latin American relations in a global context. And since the 1990s, uh, for those who need some context on this, the trade and diplomatic relations between China and Latin America and the Caribbean have grown at significant rates, trade growing at almost 31% year to year since 2001. And as often mentioned now, China is uh, Latin, or sorry, South America's biggest trade partner. And the US is the only country that outstrip, outstrips China's trade with Latin America. Latin American Chinese leaders have pursued free trade agreements, a vast network of investment, loans, and infrastructure development. And the Belt and Road Initiative has likewise grown throughout the region, with 20 Latin American countries joining China's marquee development strategy and foreign policy. Of course, China's moves into the region have produced strong criticism and pushback, predictably from Washington, which sees a soft power threat to a regional stronghold. But protest has also flowed from those who see ongoing extractivism, ecological harm and dispossession of land, growing debt with little windfall invested as key signals of how this strategy might harm Latin America and the Caribbean. Though, of course, many others push back on that and speak to uh, Latin American agency in this development strategy and the ways in which they are key actors in shaping Chinese investment. So I think there are many questions that we could discuss today, and our panelists will introduce, of course, their own thoughts and arguments. But I thought I would produce a few questions and issues for us all to think about when we get to the discussion session. So one of those would be just how coherent and fully formed is the Belt and Road Initiative in Latin America, and what degree is it putting its name to ongoing projects already? 
How effective has Chinese investment in soft power within Latin America and the Caribbean been through the BRI? A second question would be, how will these development strategies and commodity extraction regimes impact the broader regional ecology and the broader climate picture, uh, especially in the years to come? Another thing we might consider is to what degree do Latin American actors maintain influence and direction of Chinese investment and diplomatic engagement? And how should we think about Chinese multilaterals like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank? Does that form a distinct approach to credit and development finance compared to US and European finance? And lastly, I think we ought to think about on the ground how farmers and governments within Latin America are responding to Chinese agribusiness and new forms of what is often called land grabbing. So our panelists now will begin with 10 minute statements and then we'll turn to questions from the audience. Uh, Professor Wise will lead us off. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Aaron. I'm so really honored to be at UCL. And I can see this amazing audience. Half of you should be speaking in my place. You probably know more than I do at this point. I want to start with a word of memoriam for my colleague and friend, Kevin Metalbrook. Um, when people die, it's always shocking. I'm still shocked. I want to say that my very first article on Mexico uh, that was published in a top journal. Uh, late, 10 years later, he approached me at, a, at the LASA conference and said he was the reviewer on it. And it's always nice when somebody comes up and tells you that, especially since you're already tenured, right? <laughs> so uh, I, I really, uh, it's a loss. Um, let me begin. We don't have a lot of time. Um, Aaron has posed some uh, very good questions. I'm just gonna go bing, bing, bing and answer your questions from the Carol Wise perspective. First, how coherent is uh, Belt and Road in Latin America? I don't see Reese Jenkins here. If you're here, Reese, uh, I'm sorry. But he published uh, the first, I think, uh, you know, economistic, if you will, factual article, super factual on Belt and Road in Latin America. It came out in, I believe, the Journal of Chinese Current Affairs. Uh, now, it was premature because it came out in 2021. And of course, um, BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, didn't come to Latin America until 218. So according to Reese Jenkins, thus far, it's had a rather minimal impact. Uh, there's some, obviously there's some, you know, uh, intervening factors. Uh, one of those factors is of course COVID. Um, and the other factor is um, the state of the Chinese economy. Uh, I'm sorry, Kevin isn't here. He's like the number guy. Uh, with regard to flows of capital uh, from China to Latin America, but certainly um, they've been zero for at least the last two or three years. So BRI, yes, China's claiming everything they've done in Latin America, including uh, the renovation of the Argentine railroad and uh, hydroelectric plants in Argentina or whatever, they're claiming everything is BRI. But in fact, I believe there's been very little, maybe millions, as to quote Reese Jenkins, millions rather than billions of dollars have been dispersed. Um, local agency and uh, ability to uh, engage, that is to say on the Latin American side, vis-a-vis -vis China, I wrote a whole book on that. I'm gonna speak on that uh, as my main subject. Um, and then uh, is the uh, AIIB, is it that different from others? No, in fact, uh, I have many Chinese students, many brilliant Chinese students, and one of my seniors did a, um, an honors thesis on AIIB. And when you go down and you look at the projects, um, they're all partnered with the World Bank, the Asia Development Bank, and to be honest, I consider that really positive because that means that AIIB uh, is a player uh, in, the, in the realm of upholding uh, the kinds of norms that Gustavo is an expert on, especially environmental norms uh, and all of the, the kinds of multilateral agency, iffy norms, if you will, that um, that most of us applaud. They have other issues, but AIIB has not engaged in any of those other issues like austerity measures and getting involved in conditionality with regard to economic reform. So I think AIIB has been a nice, it's been a good healthy infusion of capital um, and a partner. Again, if you look at the loans, it's very interesting, but AIIB is not operating on its own. It's in partnership with the main institutions as I can see it. 
let me turn to my um, book. My book came out on March uh, 23rd, 2020, which is the day the United States completely shut down. Uh, if any, I, 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 it's for free. I send it for free now since I got no marketing, no nothing. Um, but what it does is take us right up to the eve of uh, the break with, with regard to, I mean, there's a before and after now. And of course the before is before COVID. Uh, well, there's two befores, before the end of the commodity boom, which I write about, but also um, before COVID and of course after COVID. So if we look at this in terms of phases, I would say right now we're in phase four of China-Latin American relations, and it's very unclear. Phase one, I would say, um, is the uh, kind of warm up to this uh, with regard to the opening of China in 78 and many of the Latin American countries uh, engaging in important reforms. They meet together in phase two, which is the commodity boom that takes off from, as Kevin calls it, the China boom, <clears throat> takes off from 2003 uh, to 213. That's uh, phase two. Phase three is this very sad period, not unexpected. I hoped it wouldn't happen, but it's the post commodity boom. Um, and that is, we see three survivors that I write about, Peru, Chile, and um, Costa Rica. And then we see a very sad uh, kind of institutional resource curse, uh, not, not the old fashioned one where industry uh, languishes. It's this kind of 21st century institutional course where, for example, uh, President uh, Cristina, former President Cristina Fernandez just goes into the central bank of Argentina and uses it as her personal checking account, right? Just taking out money from the central bank or uh, the Petrobras scandal in 2014, where everybody, including our beloved Lula, everybody dipped their hand in that tilt to the tune of billions of dollars in corruption. Uh, and Brazil had fought for years to get investment grade rating with the international financial system and both Petrobras, which was listed on the New York Stock Exchange and the country lost their investment grade rating in about three months. As a political economist, I take that personally. Um, when countries finally get an investment grade rating, it's a very big thing. And they, they fought and they fought hard for it and they just threw it away. So let me just say a few things about, I'm looking at the time, I don't wanna be a time hog, um, but let me just say a few things about the current period. Um, so just my book, all right? We had three survivors, I just mentioned them. We had two institutional resource curse cases, which is Brazil and Argentina. And then we have Mexico, which is an enigma um, because um, the, uh, the Trump, the US trade war that the Trump administration declared on China showed us that when Chinese uh, auto parts, all kinds of other intermediate electronic goods are basically shut out of the US market. They begin sourcing Mexico. They source Mexican auto parts and electric goods. Intermediates are things you need for final production, right? Uh, and this is China's success. It built its career, if you will. It built its economy on the production and export of intermediate goods and they're very high quality. So Mexico, uh, through no <laughs> through no effort of his own, is now thriving, exporting these intermediate goods to China. What does this show us? This shows us that um, this is happening. I don't believe in the free market, but this is happening somewhat of a, a if you will, a market miracle of sorts, a protectionist driven market miracle. But let me just say that imagine if you had a little bit of push a little bit of industrial policy, a little bit of competition policy, which Mexico got rid of in 94, this could be a serious situation of Mexico, China, uh, intra-industry trade and production, um, which would be a big boom for Mexico. Mexico is probably the most, excuse me if you're a Mexican, I've said this in Mexico, the most racist toward China, uh, the most antagonistic, uh, it goes back all the way to the first trade deficit that Mexico registered with China in 1989. They never have gotten over it and it's ballooned. So let me say that um, 
it's a mixed picture. And also let me say that I fear that many of my findings, especially my success cases, uh, that might be a historical insight. I'm not sure about now. Uh, let me finish. Let me just say that uh, China's COVID zero, um, it's, it's refusal to get um, a more powerful vaccine. Um, they're still relying on an 80% Sinovac uh, vaccine. And now with the protest, this, you know, let it, let it all rip of Chinese now coming out. Many are afraid to come out still, and I don't blame them. Um, but I think that from the beginning of COVID, public opinion shows, opinion polls, and I'm getting this from Francisco Rodinius at Chile Catholic University. Um, he has written twice, two great pieces on how even though uh, public opinion polls show that Latin Americans, minus probably Brazil and Colombia, but Latin Americans um, prize China over the US, even with the departure of Trump. However, however, they will never forgive China uh, for being, if you will, the source uh, of the COVID uh, pandemic. So it's this mixed bag. What's happening right now in Peru, this is my baby and my first book was on Peru, is painful to watch. Brazil, um, now everybody's a Brazilian analyst. I mean, I've heard like people I, I know nothing about Brazil opining on Brazil. We need to hear it from the Brazilian, but um, you know, the Brazilian situation is pathetic, um, but that doesn't have so much to do with China, all right? That has to do with all of these this baggage, the reform backlog, the polarized income, the polarized politics that were covered over by a commodity boom. Um, and then everybody was sort of aplastado, as we say, during, you know, Brazil and Argentina have been in a deep, deep depression since 2014. Uh, and it's, I think, reform weariness, recession weariness, and now COVID weariness, right? Um, and I, I'm sorry to say, I thought that we had gotten past this thing. I guess 50, 50 people have died in Peru defending Castillo um, out in the regions. And Brazil, 1,400 people are arrested for that ridiculous wannabe January 6th, <laughs> uh, you know, saga that played out on Sunday. So uh, it's a very uncertain time in China Latin America relations. And my final word, and this is where I'm going, is to sit back and not look for the next big thing, but let's look for really what has happened. Uh, Cynthia Sanborn at Pacific University in Lima has a team that's gone and looked at private Chinese investment in the economy that is really separate from Belt and Road or any of these other initiatives. And that is, I think, where the future lies, which is old fashioned production driven investment coming from mainly the private sector uh, into countries like Peru. And Chile's got it, but it's very hard to find. You really have to go data mining for it. Um, but I think right now as a time of assessment, uh, you know, I'm not, I, I think that, uh, you know, there isn't gonna be any big new thing in China and Latin American relations. It's, it's really just kind of stepping back, where are we? And where do we wanna go with this? Where does the region wanna go with it? Thank you. Thanks, Carol. That was excellent. I, I really enjoyed that. Gustavo, do you want to take it from there? Sure. I'm happy to to go forward. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Aaron, for the invitation. It's it's really an honor to be here uh, with you folks. You know, UCL is such a remarkable institution. Uh, hopefully, you know, Kevin will will come in and we'll we'll be able to carry on the conversation with him too. Um, like Carol, I'm going to begin by making very brief responses to your four questions, and then I'm going to walk through some of my notes, uh, and they're more, much more narrowly focused on China-Brazil relations, because that's really where I feel more, um, more comfortable speaking with some confidence. Um, so first, you know, how coherent is the BRI in Latin America? Um, I um, agree with Carol here, as I've published in the journal Contemporary China, uh, BRI is really a label that is applied to many pre-existing projects. It is uh, used um, pragmatically by actors in Latin America when they want to attract Chinese investment. It's used pragmatically by Chinese actors when they want to say that whatever initiative they've been working on has this 
larger political backing or strategic significance. But uh, it, it does not do too much work beyond that. Uh, how effective has it been? Well, we have to understand then how effective has it been in that kind of discursive format, not so much just in the dollars and cents of it, but how effective has it been to call something BRI or not? I think that where we're going to see this question coming up now uh, with Lula's election in Brazil is, will Brazil formally enter the BRI, which it hasn't yet? You know, some other Latin American countries have. Now, that might not mean too much. That might not make a lot of political economic difference for the kind of investments that are, were in the works that will be coming out will probably play through whether or not it's under that kind of diplomatic you know, framework. But I think that it does some diplomatic, you know, it carries some diplomatic weight. And I think it's more in that kind of soft power kind of dynamics that it, we have to think of its efficacy. Um, impact of ecology and climate and land grabbing, I'll get to at the end, but I wanna first talk about um, you know, Latin American actors influence on Chinese investments and Chinese finance. Um, similarly, in some of my publications, I, I really try to emphasize more the role of Latin American actors in not only attracting Chinese investment, but when we talk about Latin American actors, I think it's very important for us to kind of break out of some of the, what John Agnew calls the territorial trap and the institutional bias that we have in a lot of the IR uh, literature. It's not just government actors. It's not just formal company you know, officials social movements, you know, different segments of society, you know, labor, these things matter. And Latin American politics writ large, not just the kind of big party, big, big name politics, those really shape where Chinese investments are able to get rooted or not, you know, and how are they able to play out or not. So it's a much more complex and nuanced approach, I think, from a kind of like a bottom up sense of political economy that we need to have a sense. And in that sense, Latin America has a very vibrant civil society. And in much of my work, I show over and over again how political ecological struggles in Brazil that have nothing to do with you know, the fact that it's a Chinese investor, but those political ecological struggles constrain, shape, transform the conditions under which Chinese investment take place. We need to have attention to that kind of gra grassroots level political ecological struggles. As for ecology and climate and land grabbing, I think that there's a huge red herring. There's two big red herrings here. On the one hand, the kind of China hawks uh, in Brazil and Latin America, you know, internationally, who talk about a lot of Chinese land grabbing, I think um, are really overplaying, you know, this role of this big bad China, which is not so coherent, nor is it really the main investor in farmland or natural resources um, in Brazil or Latin America. In a couple of cases, in a couple of segments, it had, does play a big role, but it's actually not that different than transnational capital in general. And really why, by focusing on Chinese capital in that way, what it does is that it kind of provides a cover for capital from the global north as if that is fine and there's something wrong with Chinese capital. You know, we can have, and I have many critiques of transnational capital, of Chinese investments in Brazil, of the kind of focus on commodities and a lot of the ecological impacts that we'll have, you know, like locking in commodity dependence as well as, you know, serious environmental issues, you know, not just deforestation, but contamination with pesticides, you know, mining being terribly problematic and so forth and so on. But those aren't problems because it's Chinese investment. Those are problems of capitalism. Now, Chinese companies are becoming major players in global capital. They should be criticized not because they're Chinese. They should be criticized because they're capitalist. That is one big red herring. The other big red herring is the one that um, actually puts me at odds, even with some of my closest colleagues and many people here you know, on, in, this, in, in this meeting. It's that I'm very skeptical of sustainable development. Uh, I'm very skeptical of, of green economy. I'm very skeptical of eco-modernization. It is important, and China and Brazil are probably going to set on a, on a very strong um, process now of developing solar, uh, wind energy. These things matter. You know, biofuels, insofar as we can reduce fossil fuels, it makes a difference. But if, again, these new energies, um, if, again, these environmental, these sustainable development initiatives are taking place, 
largely under capitalist frameworks, they will continue to carry on inequalities, exploitation, extractivist relations with various environments, and not just what they take out, but also what they leave behind. So the intensification of agro-industry in Brazil, which has been largely driven not just by Chinese markets, but increasingly also by Chinese pesticide, cheap Chinese pesticide coming into Brazil. That is extremely problematic, you know, and it's, we can't just say, oh, now we're gonna have more sustainable soy. Is the soy is, well, when we talk about sustainable development, what do we want to sustain? For whom? You know, there are deeper layer questions that I think we need to ask. So in my, my last four or five minutes, um, I wanna walk through a couple more specifics um, about this really key moment in Brazilian uh, history and, and especially the political economy dimensions of this transition from Bolsonaro to, to a third Lula administration. To follow um, Chinese, not just official statements, but Chinese social media, uh, what you see is a lot of enthusiasm. You know, Bolsonaro is very much characterized as a very anti-China kind of tropical Trump character. And there's a lot of, you know, memories well justified of better relations under Lula governments um, before. So it's clear that the intention on both sides is to deepen Brazil-China relations beyond economy, beyond just trade, beyond even investment. So diplomacy, cooperation, and international law, uh, these things are coming way up. You know, re-engagement of multilateral agencies, um, you know, across Latin America, but internationally, these things are gonna play a much bigger role. And even within economy, What's interesting is that this is not the 2000s anymore. Lula cannot ride a big commodity boom the way he did, as Carol shows in her book so spectacularly. There has to be a different approach. And what the Lula government is presenting now is to go beyond soy, iron, and oil. And that it doesn't mean China is not important. That doesn't mean we're going to reduce our partnership with China. It means, and both sides are speaking this language very clearly, cooperation and technological innovation digital economy, the green economy, um, infrastructure, and new energy. All this, like I said, for people who are not China hawks, but the opposite, sound great. But we still have to ask questions. You know, what are the political ecological contradictions of this green economy? You know, of course, it's better than climate denialism. It's better than neo-fascist, you know, ridiculousness of anti-globalization self-destruction that we had under Bolsonaro. But it doesn't mean that we're just off in the clear. It means that now we're able to start to have serious you know, conversations about what kind of green economy do we want? What kind of partnerships can we see there? Now, the really key thing I think that uh, we need to pay attention to in the new Brazilian administration's proposal, right away, there's eight key items that Lula um, has already laid out and started to implement. The one that affects Brazil-China relations the most is the withdrawal of the plan to privatize eight state-owned companies in Brazil. First and foremost, Petrobras, and as well as several logistic companies. Now, a possible privatization of Petrobras and logistic companies would be, would be placing Chinese investors as major contenders. You know, think about the Presal, like when Brazil really made huge advancements in offshore uh, oil, Chinese companies were key players in in that process, it would not be surprising if a privatization of Petrobras ended up with you know, a big Chinese stake growing there. No, that is not gonna happen anymore. That's off the table. That doesn't mean though, that there's not gonna be Chinese participation collaboration with, with Petrobras or with Brazilian logistic companies, but that those are gonna take place under a very different dynamic. It's not gonna be this kind of new liberal privatization. It's gonna have to be a kind of partnership more like what we had seen during the 2000s. Um, on finance, this is where uh, I'm hoping that Kevin will, will join because I was really hoping to, to discuss this with him. And this gets back to that discourse around land grabbing and natural resource focus and so on. <clears throat> if you only look at Chinese development bank loans, China Development Bank, Exim Bank to Latin America, they're in the billions and they're very narrowly focused in a few major countries, including Brazil, and a few sectors, infrastructure and energy, meaning particularly, especially oil and such. 
that's where the big bucks oftentimes go. And that has actually consolidated a lot of a narrative that Chinese finance in Latin America, particularly in places like Brazil, is natural resource seeking. Okay, the thing is that although those are announcements are in the billions, that money doesn't just automatically flow. It's not just magically there. It's a much more complex process. And if you actually parse it out, and if you look at Chinese finance more broadly, there's a very interesting phenomenon happening, which is that Chinese commercial banks, I'm talking about the Bank of China, ICBC, um, Bank of Communications, uh, and CCB, China Construction Bank, have made very fast and strong entrances into Brazil. And this has been flying under the radar. Now, they're not you know, competing with the big banks in Brazil for the kind of commercial markets there, but they are becoming key players in specifically uh, currency exchange, in internationalize, internationalizing the yuan, the renminbi. That is a very you know, strategic sector that will have long-term consequences. And this ties in exactly, and I'll end very soon here, with, you know, as Carol pointed out, what can we see going forward in terms of Chinese investments in Brazil, Chinese economic cooperation in Brazil? It's not going to just be at the level of Petrobras, and you know, it's not going to just be at the level of major state-owned companies. As the policy statements are coming out, and as we actually start to see in the political economic reality, it is much more about um, having small and medium enterprises, you know, coming in with a much more diverse set of um, economic activities. And these are the ones that actually depend on, rely upon, and will drive things like turning to these Chinese commercial banks in Brazil for their trade finance, turning to the Chinese commercial banks in Brazil for their currency exchange operations. It's a sort of capitalization of political economic relations that I think we're going, we're already seeing, and we're going to see much more now that it's going to have this kind of more higher level support from Brazil. And those are the players that are really going to be engaged in what Lula is trying to do now, which is to reindustrialize Brazil. Like Carol said, industrial policy, you know, and say we can't just depend on exporting commodities anymore. That doesn't mean we're anti China, but that means that we want Chinese companies to bring this kind of technology and capital so that we can build up like this, you know, so that Brazil might follow a bit more, as Carol was pointing out, the kind of Mexico strategy, the Mexico path. That can definitely be in the works. And I think that our point of view as, as critical scholars is going to be to look carefully at these dynamics. Oh, I'm sorry about that. And, you know, celebrate what is positive, but also hold accountable the, the, the contradictions that they have, you know, because there, there's a lot of, a lot of um, problematic things that fly under the radar, as I said, not because they're Chinese, but because they're the nature of the kind of political, economic, and ecological struggles that we live in, in, in this kind of capitalist world economy. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gisela. I, I just greatly enjoyed both of those opening statements. Um, so much great discussion of some of those key issues that we should be thinking about. Um, why don't we open it up for questions? If you have a question, please use the uh, raise hand function on Zoom or post it into chat, and then I'll go from there. Maxine. Hi, sorry about uh, earlier, inability to hear anything. Um, I to hear uh, Carol and Gustavo opening remarks and um, your two hour very, very interesting panel. I want to ask actually about debt, uh, which is Latin America indebtedness to China. Is it um, a problem or is it just uh, one of the things that Latin America will be able to cope with? And is it sizable? That's, uh, that's, I haven't seen anything that really engages with this, but perhaps you can help me out on that one. Thanks. Uh, Carol or Gustavo, the, the audio is a little choppy for me there. Were, were you able to hear the question? I think Maxine is asking about um, Latin American debt owed to China. Is that right? Is it problematic? Is it heavy? I'll say something and then I'll let Gustavo say something. Um, it depends, right? Uh, so I would say that these um, 
uh, it's mainly the two big policy banks, the two, two big development banks, as Gustavo was saying, that are lending to countries. And as he said, and I should have emphasized, it's just a handful of countries, right? It's really, yeah. uh, uh, well, Mexico's got a few loans. They, sh they should be, Mexico should be doing more business with China. They're not, and it's on them. But um, uh, in South America, uh, so the big money has gone to Brazil, Argentina, uh, Peru, and increasingly Chile in terms of project investments. Uh, we have these earlier loans, uh, Chinese loans, like early on in the commodity boom, I think 2006, 2007, uh, that went to Ecuador and Venezuela. Uh, these mm -hmm. are loans for oil deals. They're a disaster. Uh, there was no conditionality. Um, you know, both Venezuela and Ecuador have been in arrears for years on these. And what's interesting is that, and I'm not an expert on this, Kevin is. Hello, Kevin, where are you? <laughs> I'm texting you. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I do know that just from, you know, uh, doctoral students, Argentine, you know, Ecuadorian students and whatnot, that the um, the Chinese have been uh, very proactive in finding ways to restructure that aren't too onerous, stretching out the debt, uh, you know, doing all the kinds of things. I believe in a more progressive fashion versus regressive than say the old Brady debt, you know, restructurings in eighty nine ninety. So um, those two are really, that they've actually got, um, you know, they've got China in a debt trap. And then there's these things going on with Argentina, which is just recklessly squandering anything it gets uh, from China. It's squandered. And the Chinese have also tried very hard there. Now, they, they brought the, the International Monetary Fund into both Argentina and Ecuador. Venezuela refused. They dropped out of the fund or whatever. So... If we look back at the kinds of restructuring that so-called restructuring and and you know rollovers and whatnot that went um, that went on in the 80s, I mean, keep in mind, big debtors in Latin America are still paying interest on those debts from the Latin American debt crisis of 1982-83. So there, it's interest upon interest. So the Chinese are trying hard not to do that. That to that is to their credit. However, it overlooks the fact as to there's other areas um, of the world. I, there's so many, Montenegro, God, you know, uh, it's like a hundred billion dollar loan to Montenegro for a, a road to Serbia that stops in the middle of nowhere. So, I mean, some of this stuff is really out there. In the Latin American region, I don't think it's been egregious, all right? And I, there are people that say that, oh, these loans to Ecuador and Venezuela were partly ideologically driven. You know, there was an affinity between Marxism and socialism and whatnot. I don't believe that at all. I think the Chinese wanted a foot in the oil market in Latin America. They were new. They, they didn't really start outward investment until 2007, 2008. They were new to this and they, they went to the easiest places to make a deal. But it's not, a it's not a happy story for those countries, but neither is it the kind of usual brutal, you know, debt carousel that we've seen um, earlier in the 80s. Right, thanks. Yeah, I largely agree with Carol. Um, I, I, you know, Brazil, um, not counting Venezuela uh, and those loans that Carol was talking about is the largest debtor, uh, about $30 billion. Um, and unlike Venezuela and Ecuador, those are not these kind of highly problematic uh, uh, loans that she was describing. Um, but also in the context of Brazil having suffered massive debt crisis in the 80s and the way that that then triggered terrible structural adjustment policies um, and so forth and so on, uh, neoliberalization together with the redemocratization in the 90s, we don't see that. Uh, Brazil has crashed from the commodity boom. Um, these loans have not had that kind of effect. As a matter of fact, the, the kind of policy crises that Brazil has fallen into in the last few years have largely been self-inflicted. You know, with the impeachment slash parliamentary coup against Dilma, um, the neoliberal administration that came after with Temer and then 
the deepening of the crisis under Bolsonaro have been entirely of a, of a domestic political nature. Um, there was no influence at all from say debt to China uh, or as a matter of fact, debt to anywhere else. Uh, also specifically with China, Brazil has had a, you know, a, a positive uh, balance of trade. Um, and you know, given that dollar denomination is very important for these kind of international loans, it, it, it'd be hard pressed to talk about China, you know, these Chinese loans having this kind of negative role, at least in the case of Brazil. Now that might be different in, in some other countries and some smaller smaller economies and here and there, but we, we, it, it's part of that. It, it's another dynamic to, to talk about like debt trap diplomacy in Latin America. For me, it sounds more like the kind of red herring, kind of like Chinese land grabbing then it really helps us understand the political economic dimensions of either the bilateral relations or what I think is more important, you know, the kind of global political economy in, in which this is taking place. Thanks, Gustavo. Thanks, Carol. Right. And thanks, Maxine, for the question as well. Um, would anyone else? Yeah, Shinsei, do you want to go ahead? Hi, thank you, um, Carol and uh, Gustavo, for your wonderful presentation. And I have two questions. One is about reindustrialization in Latin American countries. When I was in Chile, I talked with some Chinese executives. And I was told that even though they would like to have the factories uh, in Chile, but it's difficult because the global value chain or the supply chain is not available and it would be more expensive for them to produce locally. So I wonder whether you have any suggestions of how um, policymakers in Latin America could, uh, could address this uh, problem. And second uh, question is about Chinese investment in digital infrastructure. Uh, for example, um, the, the data shows that uh, Latin American countries have relatively low, uh, or uh, in other words, the digital divide is quite obvious in many Latin American countries. For example, in Brazil, the digital divide uh, in rural urban area is more obvious. 78% uh, uh, population in Brazil has internet access but in rural area is only about 50%. So um, Chinese tech firms that offer maybe cheaper option uh, of comparable quality of the uh, technology and equipment. But when we talk about the local agency, United States could also play a role in shaping the uh, how this process play out. So I wonder how Latin American countries could navigate that in when they choose between Chinese tech firms versus Western tech firms. Thank you. Can I take this first? Go for it. Thank you, Shin. That is really a fabulous set of questions. Let me go to, I, I think Gustavo knows more about digital infrastructure, but let me talk about the industrial policy because um, Lula had an industrial policy uh, during his you know, stint from 2003, I think, to 2010. And um, Kathy Hochstetter and Al Montero published an amazing article, I think it's the Journal of Development Studies, where they really broke that down, like where did that money go? And it went through Bindi's, the you know, Chinese or the Brazilian Development Bank. Um, but what was fascinating is that uh, the 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 uh, the administration uh, had really targeted like. There are a lot of startups. There are a lot of small kind of high value added uh, companies and whatnot in Brazil and in Argentina. Uh, but in Brazil, the idea was to uh, pick 20 companies and really channel resources toward them like a development, development bank would. Resources for everything from technology, technology upgrading, marketing, all the usual things, skills, getting into these value chains, exporting more and whatnot. And then you see the result of where the money went. This is a lot of money. I think it was something like $80 billion. And there was like this magnetic force. It was almost like a centrifugal force where, oh, uh, gee, it went toward oil. Oh, it went toward mining. 
oh, it went toward these huge agro projects. And the companies, the 20 targeted companies, um, got a very small portion of this. They may have gotten like 10%. So when I said earlier, like now's a really good time to see on the ground, like where are those companies? What are those companies doing? You know, have they made it through this horrible pandemic, et cetera? Um, so Argentina had an industrial um, policy under um, Kirchner, uh, Kirchner one, and um, it was just a slush fund coming out of the, the office of the president. It was really sad. Uh, it was just, you know, oh, they had a very weird block of voters supporting them. It's just like, you know, energy, energy subsidies for everybody, food subsidies. And of course, it, it's what's brought the Argentine economy to its feet to its knees right now. I just wanna say one thing about the digital um, investment, and this is the following, Jin. I can't agree with you more. Uh, there is a complementary role for the US to play. Um, when I look at US foreign investment in Latin America, and I look at Chinese foreign investment in Latin America, it's complementary, right? The US is manufacturing services, everything that would be characteristic of a uh, advanced capitalist economy in a global setting. China is everything that is um, really reflective of um, an emerging economy on the move that's looking to, you know, infrastructure, resources, and all of that to beef that up. The U.S. has an amazing role to play in complementing, for example, a lot of um, the uh, investments that are coming into Brazil, not just Chinese investments, um, but they are in these fields outside of the product or via the, the, the natural resource sector. And the U.S. could uh, really play a huge role in terms of boring things like transparency, accountability, environmental standards, all of this. But, you know, uh, Washington painted itself into a very big corner beginning with Trump. It wasn't great before, but Pence and Pompeo and all these people. And I'm very disappointed that the Biden people have followed on with this. They're not doing the, the bashing or the, the, you know, the racist comments, but it's still pretty weak. Um, there are lots of reasons for the U.S. to be looking for complementary ways to engage in Latin America vis-a-vis -vis China, and we aren't doing very much on that. Yeah, I, I largely agree with Tara's analysis too. Um, one thing I'll say about industrial policy, you know, <clears throat> that that period in the 2000s where industrial policy was a national champions policy, like in China, they say, you know, grasp the big and let go of the small. That was uh, highly problematic because it really failed, you know, as Carol pointed out. Uh, it's not clear yet whether this new Lula administration is going to repeat the same or really push for something different. The rhetoric is for something different and the conditions also are now for something different. Um, but then again, how that actually plays out is, is to be seen, but it would be, it seems from the analysis that I'm reading, um, you know, like high level Chinese analysts, not just the government, the policy, you know, but the people, you know, in Chongqingian, people, you know, in, in major institutions in China that pay attention to Latin American relations, they are very much attentive to diversifying uh, trade and economic relations, which would fit with this strategy of relying more on small and medium enterprises, relying more on a broader set of engagements rather than just focusing on the national champions. So if both sides do follow up in this way, a new type of industrial policy could emerge. Um, now, the thing, the challenge, though, and to be honest, is that a lot of this stuff does not depend just on the big money from the top down. It does not depend just on, oh, this government, that government. There are long-term structural challenges. There's been a long-term disinvestment in education in Brazil. There's been long-term disinvestment in infrastructure in Brazil. Those things are real challenges. In Brazil, the rhetoric is about the what they call custo Brasil, the Brazil cost. Oh, there's too much bureaucracy, there's too much tax, and it pushes for a very neoliberal solution to these, to this cost Brazil. But it's not about that. 
It's about making public investments in education, public investments in infrastructure, long-term commitments that will provide a context in which these small and medium enterprises can in fact benefit from industrial policy. The reason why only those big companies really benefited is because they were the only ones that had the capacity to kind of, you know, make use of that policy context, you know, and, and these things go way deeper than just one government or the other or just a bilateral relation or the other. So unfortunately, this, this is going to be a long term challenge for for Brazil. And I think it, it's typical of much of the continent. In terms of the digital um, the economy, digital divide that you're talking about, I think um, there, again, the parallel that we might expect from the 2000s under uh, the Workers' Party administration and this next decade coming up is that if you look at rural electrification in, the, in 2003, Brazil, the Brazilian countryside lacked electricity. And under the, not just the two Lula administrations, but the Juma Rousseff. So if you look at, you know, the whole period of Workers' Party administration, it was dramatically improved. The extension of electricity into the countryside was, was astounding. Now, of course, that also was part and parcel of agro-industrialization. So that also went hand in hand with, as Carol was pointing out, a lot of this kind of like, you know, kind of consolidating an agro-industrial concentrated resource dependent, you know, economy. But it also meant that households in the countryside had access to electricity, which they didn't have before. Now, if that electrification push will have a 2020s parallel, that's going to be digitalization. That's going to be the extension of, you know, better uh, coverage. That's going to be the improvement of, um, you know, cell phone infrastructure and the countryside and so forth and so on. That is doable. That is possible. That is the kind of policy that I could see happening in Brazil in the next few years, which will speak to the broad base, because Lula is not just a leftist on a leftist base. He's actually building, it's a national coalition, it's a national unity government. And it needs to kind of speak to that kind of agribusiness, conservative, rural middle class, as well as the urban, as well as the rural poor. That policy, you know, everyone can get behind it. And that also is where having a much less ideological and anti-Chinese foreign policy now enables Brazil to say, yeah, we can work with Huawei. Why not? After all, you know, Huawei and China were never spying on us the way that the US government under Obama, as you know, to, to join Carol on this, right? It's not just Republicans or Democrats. Democrats too were spying on Brazil, spying on Petrobras. Like this attitude that, oh, the, the Western companies are safer than the Chinese companies is complete bogus. And under this new climate in Brazil, it is possible to have this fact be part of the mainstream conversation, have this fact inform policy. And to say, look, if we can actually have Huawei bidding against Western companies, we're gonna be able to find who's got the best product, who's got the best prices, who's got the best fit for the kind of policy that we want to implement. You know, so it could be very positive, you know, for, for there to be more options. And my sense is that, yes, you know, just like rural electrification in the 2000s was a big push, we can see a big push now for digitalization, including and especially in the countryside. And Chinese companies can have a big part to play there. And that I think is about doing, you know, smart policy. It's not ideological. It's, it's, it's the rejection of an ideological of a narrow ideological approach that can enable that to 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 play out, you know, in hopefully a good way. Great. Um, we have a question from the chat, and then I'll come to you, Isabel, right after that. Uh, Gabriel writes, "Hi, I would like to hear your thoughts on the idea that the war of Russia against Ukraine is pushing most countries, including uh, the group of Latin America and Caribbean, to pick a side between U.S. and U.E." on one side and Russia and uh, China in the other, so they can secure the allocation of companies and resources. Um, Carol or Gustavo, would either of you like to take that one? You wanna start Gustavo? Sure. Um, 
it's interesting because under Bolsonaro, uh, they try to reach out to Russia, you know, seeing Putin as kind of a conservative Christian anti-liberal leader. Um, it put Brazil in a very weird situation. Um, and under, under Lula now, um, you're not going to see that kind of ideological cozying up to Russia. But on the other hand, much like China, you might see a more kind of like multilateral kind of like BRICS 2.0 kind of approach. Um, I think that there's going to be a lot of pragmatism in that. Um, so I think that, you know, what is interesting about this is that if you actually look at the way that Brazilian governments, both under Bolsonaro and now under Lula, navigate this thorny question, um, is to kind of reject this dichotomy that your question um, poses, Gabriel. I feel like the, the attempt to, to say, oh, third countries, you have to choose. Are you, you know, with Russia or are you with the West? Are you uh, with Russia or are you with China or are you with the US? Like, there's an attempt to resist this kind of um, dichotomization. Um, that, that's one thing that I see. And also it's, it's one thing to see, like that plays out more explicitly in things like UN Security Council uh, and General Assembly votes. Um, that's where you can kind of see these lines having to be drawn. But those lines on the other hand, don't necessarily then tell you what is going to take, like how, what does that entail for economic uh, cooperation? Brazil, you know, needs fertilizer. Um, Brazil does not want, Brazilian agribusiness especially, does not want to be restricted from access. And like if the price of global fertilizer skyrockets, if the price of global pesticides from China skyrockets, that is terrible for Brazilian agribusiness. Um, but, you know, that, does that mean that they are now going to support Russia against Ukraine in the war? No. Does that mean that because they see that war having these like, it's like jacking up the prices of corn, which is good for Brazilian sellers of corn to China. They just had like a massive shipment to China this last week. Um, Brazil might become a major supplier of corn to China because again, there's much less corn coming out of the Black Sea from Ukraine and Russia. Does that mean that um, they're going to be in favor of one side of the war or the other. No, like these things are refracted. You know, these, these things are complex. We, we cannot really talk about, again, in that territorial trap, in that kind of narrow IR framework, Brazil does this, you know, US versus China. That's not how the world really works. Countries are not people. They're not, you know, homogenous. You're going to have competing interests and you're going to have conflicting, you know, uh, like dimensions and to be attentive to those is how you're able to resist this you know oversimplified um picking aside kind of narrative i'll just say that china's playing its cards very close to its vest uh you know um at the last brouhaha summit where putin and xi jinping met she said to Putin, wrap this up quickly. We don't even know if that's true. Uh, and so if you look at the figures in terms of declining trade, two-way trade between Russia and the EU and the US, and then Russia, China, two-way trade, it's like explodes between Russia, China, explodes, and then the rest is flattening, right? The US is fighting a proxy war in Ukraine. Okay, let's get that straight. Uh, trillions of dollars wasted uh, and, and so much damage of all kinds inflicted on Iraq and Afghanistan with no results, Taliban there, right? So is providing a proxy war, is it that we're ever going to do it again? Or they're already doing it. They're already quickly escalating the kinds of weapons, the deadliness of these weapons. Oh, we're not going to do tanks with big artillery. Well, now we're doing that. Oh, we're not going to do, you know, dirty bombs. Well, now we're doing that. And so I think rightfully countries in a region like Latin America, it's just keep your head down, keep your head down. They had enough trouble already with the US under Trump. It was really nasty. Uh, Biden is still upholding a lot of tariffs that are also hurting Latin American countries, Mexico. Uh, and so they're just keeping their head down. I think they want as little to do with this as possible. So. And I, and I just can't blame them. They've got to maintain that economic relationship with Brazil. 
And as Gustavo's saying, it isn't one or the other. It's just keep your head down and, and don't say anything seriously. I mean, in the beginning, India and South Africa and Mexico were neutral. Now it's just like, you know, we don't want to get involved. I'll just add really quickly that one thing that's going to be interesting to see if, is if the new uh, chancellor, the new um, Minister of Foreign Affairs in Brazil, Vieira, is going to try to actually now um, say that Brazil can play an intermediary role, can play a role to negotiate peace. You know, under Celso Amorim in Lula's first government in the 2000s, you know, Brazil is actually trying to say, look, we can negotiate peace in the Middle East. Look, we can help negotiate the situation with Iran. You know, like, Brazil was trying to insert itself diplomatically, you know, far beyond its region to say, we're not just a regional leader, we actually can be a player. And Brazilian diplomacy before Bolsonaro was always extremely respected internationally, UN, WTO, um, you know, like several different forum where the, the sense was that Brazilian diplomats could get things done, you know, and that would be interesting if actually what we see is, you know, Vieira trying to follow in the footsteps of Celso Amorim and saying, look, Brazil has interests uh, with all these different parties, so we're not going to approach this just, you know, unilaterally picking a side, which enables us to actually be a viable, um, you know, player in negotiating, hopefully, a solution to this. That would be very interesting to see. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I think that that would be an aspiration that is very realistic for this new Brazilian administration to try. And let me just say that, oh, Putin talked about, oh, we're going to have a peace agreement. Well, then the next day, you know, it's like no holds barred. That's not going to, you know, it's, but I do think that any kind of uh, peace negotiations, contrary to the past, uh, it would have to involve some of these bricks in the emerging economies, it would have to involve them uh, because um, whether the West wants to admit it or not, um, these are more trusted players without the deep heavy baggage, uh, you know, uh, of that particular region. I was in Poland in October at a conference. The Poles are arming themselves and they have citizen militias. They're convinced the Russians are gonna invade them. That's not material for peace negotiations. I do think though a broader alliance, a G20 kind of situation is, is really the most viable. And I so agree that Latin America, especially Brazil has a role to play there. Thanks so much for that question and for those responses. Uh, Isabel, do you wanna ask your question now, please? Hi there, I have a more like broader question. Um, I'm, by the way, I'm Isabel Tarragona and, and obviously a student at UCL doing history and politics of the Americas. Um, and I'm in um, Aaron's uh, module about the uh, United States of Empire. So the US has been in my head really with this whole Latin America situation with China. And obviously that, as Carol was saying, the, the US have a big role, like what in Latin America because it's their sphere of influence and what they say like what happened with Mexico where they shut down China's I think Carol said that uh, they shut down China's uh, trade so then Mexico got was good on that but did the what my question is that the the US must have felt threatened by China's you could say invasion of Latin America and have what have they done to um to like counteract this because I mean I'm more on the side of political college like I did that last year with and I really agree with Gustavo's um, uh, opinion on uh, green economy and how it's very uh, like his, his skepticism towards it because if you know anything about like the dark side of conservation then yeah like it's, it's just a big mess pretty much um, so yeah my my what I would like to know more about is that how is the US trying to counteract China's power in Latin America because also uh Carol said again that like they have an, an emerging economy where they kind of want to take advantage of all these resources in Latin America which can also be seen in the continent of Africa for example in Zimbabwe where they're investing in mining etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah could you like expand more on how the U.S. yeah like 
I don't want to open a Pandora's box because I think it's a big topic, but yeah, just if you could say anything on that. I can start. The U.S. has handled this in the worst way possible. Um, it has been defensive, uh, offensive, both offending Latin Americans and Brazilians uh, with racist terminology uh, beginning in 2016, 215, 216. Um, they've handled it in the worst way possible. Uh, I see Michael Shifter here, uh, and he wrote a fabulous piece in Foreign Affairs uh, after the, uh, during or, and after the summit of the Americas, which was here in my city in Los Angeles. And there was nothing there, just nothing there. Many countries decided not to come because there was nothing there. There's nothing on the table. There's nothing interesting. And one thing uh, that I think is very uh, reflective of the region's stance, they've been, the U.S. is trying to put them in the middle of the U.S. and China, and it's the wrong approach. As we've said several times here, the approach should be complementary, um, and it should be one of the longest building. Um, but what I'm intrigued by is how many countries since 2016 have recognized the one China policy and left Taiwan. It's not that they, uh, diplomatically, it's not that Taiwan was better or worse. It was stick it in the eye of Washington, quite frankly. The El Salvadorans have many reasons to stick it in the eye of the United States government, right? As do many others in that that really difficult northern triangle in, in Central America. So uh, all these dick trap, all these negative things, they've handled it in the worst way possible. And I'm going to say something that could be blasphemous to say in Washington, but what is wrong with Huawei? I mean, we're spying, so they do some spy. I mean, I don't see, you go to Eastern Europe, Huawei's everywhere, right? And it's also already in many countries in Latin America. So um, I think the U.S. has, I think the China policy is terrible. I really do. Uh, the, you know, uh, the Secretary of State's complaining about human rights abuse in China. Uh, well, you know what? The president visited uh, the border yesterday, President Biden. I mean, did he go to detention centers where people are still being held without any legal due process, where families are still separated? Did he go there? I don't know. But, you know, to take a stand right now on human rights and try to do this big new Cold War thing is really hypocritical and it's ineffective. Um, Gustavo, just before you go, Carol, if you need to head out, feel free to. I want to hear Gustavo. Thank you so much. I do need to head out. Yeah. Uh, our semester just started and I've got to get cracking. So um, I want to hear Gustavo and then I will bid you all goodbye. I, I don't have too much to add. I, I agree with Carol, you know, in, in this approach, you know, it's, you know, it's worth emphasizing that the Trump initiated trade war hasn't really been fully dismantled. And um, especially when we're talking about, you know, sanctions and, you know, Huawei, those things are, they're very much about trying to, in, you know, indirectly put limitations on the capacity of these companies to be able to expand in places like Latin America and, and elsewhere. So while there might, it, 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 oftentimes it's not so direct, um, but it is very much about trying to, you know, limit China's expansion economically, diplomatically, um, you know, we that's more of a mixed bag, you know, like there, it's an interesting place to see this. It's gonna be, for example, on climate change negotiations, you know, like, um, are we going to see um, transformations in these tripartite relations between um, you know, US, um, Brazil and Latin American and Chinese actors? Um, that, that's a scenario in which I think it's possible to find more grounds for cooperation, but then again, what's really behind that are what are what are the economic interests that are driving these? Um, it's not that countries themselves have interests; it's really that their, especially their governments, are being pushed by particular economic interests to advance or not advance different kinds of climate policies, approaches to dealing with these issues. And I feel like 
it's easier to take like a case by case basis and to see, okay, what role has US diplomacy played and what are the kind of economic interests that that is speaking to? What role has Chinese diplomacy played and what kind of economic interests are they speaking to? And how do particular Latin American countries, you know, not just respond to that, but really position themselves in a way to, um, to advance their own political and economic interests in that broader you know, situation. And the last thing that I'll say is that I think you're absolutely right um, to look at the role of US in all of this, because especially from the Chinese perspective, any conversation about China-Latin America relations is always put in the context of the US looming in the background. Um, it's always, you know, partially about, you know, China, US, you know, like how, how can we relate to these Latin American countries given that this is the situation that we're dealing with the US and given that those countries are in the US backyard. That context is, you know, you cannot ignore it to really understand, uh, especially Chinese views towards Latin America. Thanks. Gustavo, are you okay to stick around for one final question? Yeah. Great. Uh, Gabrielle, do you want to go off, go with the final question then? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Gustavo and to Carol that uh, she was here. Uh, I would like to ask Gustavo about something that is happening here. Uh, well, actually, this, uh, these years in Latin America, especially South America, but also in Mexico, because, uh, you know, Carol said, uh, kind of joking, that we all we are all like uh, Brazilian experts about what's happening here uh, these days in Brazil. But this uh, this political stability, this problems with political stability, is not all. It's not only happening in Brazil. It's happening in Peru, in Mexico, in Chile, and also in Ecuador. Well, we're, I'm not gonna talk about Venezuela because. It has been for ages there, but um, especially this this countries. Uh, not only talking about pro protests, but also political uh, governments not uh, taking into account or deslegitimating the the electoral pro the electoral process there. For example, in Mexico, Lopez Obrador. So I would like to uh, ask Gustavo: Does China? think that this is not important for investments in Latin America or or his or they say well it's, it's not important we can still do investments there democracy is not important for for us thank you so if i understand your question you're asking does does the chinese government uh, care or not care about challenges to democracy in latin america Yes. For example, like, you know, questioning the electoral processes. Is that what you're asking? Yes, yes. Um, so, again, like, I, I think we need to be careful about, you know, China thinks this. China, China is not a person, you know. China, there's the Chinese central government, which has different you know, agencies and, and individuals, and there's different Chinese governments and state levels, and there's Chinese companies, and there's Chinese people, and their diversity. But um, in, if we were to generalize, you know, both Chinese government and even popular views are that economy, that stability, political stability is required for economic growth. That is assumed. Um, now, that is interpreted in by some people meaning that you know a democratic stability is good and is necessary and when you have the instability democratically like in peru um you know where where like presidents are being impeached and overthrown as happened in brazil also in previous years or whether you just have more kind of like protests like civil instability that those things are then bad for the economy that is a very common assumption um, which might then lead to saying, well, it matters that democratic institutions are strong and stable. On the other hand, there's also the kind of a more cynical analysis of that, which is, well, what matters is stability, whether or not it is democratic. So if you have an 
autocratic regime that is at least stable, that's good for business. Um, and, and you hear both opinions, um, and oftentimes it correlates more on what the domestic, you know, Chinese actors' analysis is of their own political situation, you know, whether they celebrate the autocratic stability that China has and say that's why we're able to have economic growth, whether they would like to have more democratic, you know, forms and they think that that would be even better. So oftentimes that's what's kind of at stake in between the lines. But, you know, what, what I think is more important for us Latin Americans to, to take from this conversation is not so much, you know, what do they think, do they care whether our democracies are stable or not? Do they care where our, whether our, our countries are democratic or not? It's really this assumption, you know, that what, what do we mean by stability? You know, this is a conversation that we have uh, oftentimes with, you know, Chinese colleagues of mine. Look, during the dictatorship in Brazil, you know, you, you didn't have protest, <laughs> uh, you had economic growth, but is that the kind of economic growth that we want? Does that really benefit? You know, like in what kind of even international politics does that lead, lend themselves to? Uh, on the other hand, you can look at the, at the dictatorship period and you can say, look, people were being murdered. Um, there was no rule of law. There's the kind of civil instability, um, you know, and even though you had a few years of like rapid economic growth, that then led to like a terrible stagnation in the 80s where like it was the debt of the dictatorship from the 60s and 70s that trapped the country into a lost decade of the 80s that then was solved with neoliberal reforms in the 90s that just deepened the crisis and so forth and so on. Um, and the really messy politics of redemocratization um, on the one hand led to a kind of renewal of economic growth but under a particular you know, condition. So I think that what we really have to do is to kind of first see, like I said, that there are different Chinese interpretations of stability, uh, both are we talking about political stability, we're talking about civil stability, and their relationship with economic growth. And second, we really have to question, you know, don't those assumptions, you know, where do those assumptions come from? Do, do we share those assumptions? Are they realistic or not? Um, does, it, does it matter or not? Because to be honest, um, capital can thrive in chaos. And um, at the same time, you know, a type of more long-term sustainable economic development cannot. Like I mentioned before in the, in the response to another question um, about industrial policy, if you don't have strong, stable, thriving education sector, you're not going to be able to have, you know, small, medium enterprises. You're not going to be able to have companies like that benefiting from industrial policy. And those things are, they're much more relevant than whether or not um, a president was impeached. You know, um, I, I honestly, I do not feel I can comment too specifically on the, the, the recent situation in Peru or, or Ecuador or these other countries. But what I would encourage you to do is to, to understand that Chinese, understand, uh, Chinese interpretations of what is happening here are not going to be just on the one side of, oh, this is chaos, this is bad, and we'd rather it be a, a, a stable dictatorship, but also that we should not then basically get trapped in problematic assumptions of these relationships between stability and economic growth. Thanks, Gustavo. That was excellent. Um, that brings our panel to the end. Um, if you join me in thanking Gustavo and Carol, who, who's left already, but thanking our panelists uh, for their excellent discussion and conversation. Uh, 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 Jin, did you have something to add in here? Or is that just the applause <laughs> emoji it might be? But anyways. Sorry, thank... sorry, just to no. say thank you. <laughs> okay, sorry, that's my fault. Uh, th thank you so much to Gustavo and, and Carol for such an excellent discussion. This will be recorded and available through our YouTube channel uh, probably in, in a few days or so. But thanks to you again. I, I greatly enjoyed this discussion. Thank and you thanks so everyone, much. everyone for coming out. Great panel, thanks. Thank you, Aaron, for inviting. Thanks, thank you. Thanks, Gustavo. I enjoyed it. Everyone, for your yeah. questions. It was great.
All right. Bye, everyone.